20. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to, the, to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me, he said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister, so that I took her to be my wife? This, um, last week we started on our journey with Abram. And Abram, who would become Abraham, was at the beginning of ver uh, chapter 12. And we stopped right at verse 10. So we leave, oh, let's stop at verse 9. We'll read, and we we'll leave right off where we were last week. Um, last week, he's a hero. He crushed it. He, he was awesome. Um, but this week, not so much. This week, our friend disappoints us. Um, but you know what? Isn't that life for any believer in Yahweh? Uh, we have our good days where we crush it, we're on it, we're there, we're, we're on top of the mountain. And we have our days where we're just, we disappoint a little bit. Uh, but that's where God's grace comes in. Um, so last week, um, he was obedient. God told him to go, and he did go. He did, and he went um, faithfully. God told Abram and his family to leave the town of Comfort in Haran, where they were settled in, and they had their property, they had their friends, and they, they, they were all ready to go. Like, where they were, they were comfortable. And God told them to go, and to a land that would normally, they would eventually be called the Promised Land in Canaan. Abram had to have faith, and he had to have trust God, and he did. He had faith, and he trusted God, and he was obedient. And God told him three promises. I will give you three promises, he says, with this new covenant I have with you. One, I'm going to promise you land. Two, I'm going to promise you offspring, descendants. And three, I'm going to promise you great blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And I will bless you and your name and make your name great so you can be a blessing. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. But here's the thing. Between where 9 is, verse 9 is, and where 10 is, there comes a great famine. A great famine and it's severe. So Abram, in his desperation, and God moves people throughout the Old Testament there's a couple of different people where God moves from one, one location to the next because of a famine. And he goes to, he leaves the land of Canaan, and he goes into Egypt. And as they were getting ready to go to Egypt, they're outside Egypt, him and his wife are walking, or they're in their, um, on their camels or whatever they were. They, and he turns to his wife, and he says, listen. Things are about ready to get real here. Um, this could turn out pretty bad for the both of us. Um, now, I know I don't tell you this enough, but you're very attractive. I mean, honestly, you're an eight, probably. Okay, fine, you're an eight and a half. I know I should tell you more. You're hot. I get it. Um, but, you know, we're married, and I'm concerned. Because when they find out that we're married... They're probably going to kill me. They're going to want to take you. They're going to want to kill me, get me out of the way. Let's just go ahead and tell a little bit of a lie. Let's just tell them we're brother and sister. That way they won't kill me, and that you'll still be alive. I don't know what's going to happen to you after that, but you'll still be alive. So I am no marriage expert. I do the best I can. 
you know, we, Mandy and I, who's not here today because Charlotte has a little bit of a cold, you know, we, we give it to the Lord and we do the best we can. We've been married now a little bit over 10 years, a little over 10 years. And I know that's not near long, as long as some of you fine folks in here. But I will say in my 10 years, I will say this, I've learned this. If I do something like that to my wife, it's not going to end well. If I just say, you know what, I'm concerned for me, I'm just going to go ahead and hope the best for you, send you on your way, we would have, our marriage would be fractured. Our marriage would suffer. Our marriage, Mandy would come out with some boxing gloves on and say, let's do this. I can't believe you did this to me. She would get, maybe get a little physical, a little violent with me. She might even throw me out a window or something like that. <laughs> Let's do that one more time. She might even throw me out. That's me. That's what would happen to me if I did what that gentleman did that one day. But, hey, we're not here to judge Abram. Thank you, Samuel. <laughs> if I did something like that to Mandy, our marriage would be fractured. Um, he lies. He does. Uh, he doesn't trust the Lord. He lies because he didn't trust. And he throws his marriage throws it up to caution in the wind. We'll see what happens. So what we do see here is that Abram is not trusting God, and he begins to plot, and he begins to scheme. I mean, God came to him personally. It said the Lord appeared and spoke to him. You think if God showed up to you and told you personally, hey, I'm going to take care of you, hey, your offspring's going to be great, hey, I'm going to do this and do this, you're going to move to the promised land, you would say, okay, and you would hope you'd have enough faith, enough trust in God that you would go with his plans. But he got scared. As the kids say, scared. He started plotting. He started scheming. He was afraid for his life. He was afraid of Pharaoh. And he was afraid of the unknown. He didn't trust the promises at that point in time. He says, I know that you're a beautiful woman, but I'm concerned for my life here. I don't have the power to stop you. Nobody's going to defend me. I have to come up with a plan. It's up to me. But what ends up happening is, is with all the plotting and all the scheming, he gives up his wife. He sacrifices what is dear to God himself. He, he Most we, we know that those who've been married, we're supposed to put our spouse up here. Like, there's God, there's our spouse. And then, but he takes his spouse and he puts it all the way down here. When that fear sets in, guys, we're dangerous. We are dangerous. And he's a danger to his wife at that point in time. Rather than saying, Sarai, hey, I know things might get dicey, but God gave us some promises I would rather die than have something happen to you. I'm going to be truthful. I'm going to have integrity. God's going to see us through this. God gave us those promises. I know it's going to work out. I trust him. But it didn't happen that way. She goes along with this plotting and scheming. We'll pick up right there in verse 14. And Abram came to Egypt. The Egyptians saw that Sarai was a beautiful, very beautiful woman. So the Egyptians agreed with the synopsis that she is at least an eight. Like she's a really good, attractive woman. Like she is, she is, she's hot. And then we get to verse 15 and 16. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake. And Abram acquired sheep and cattle male and female donkeys, male and female servants and camels. So despite all the horribleness of Abram right here, his lack of faith, his fear, his just throwing his marriage up to the caution of the wind, Abram gets on top financially. Pharaoh pretty much said, hey, I want this woman to be a part of this household. I'll show you great favor. Just take these things and be gone. I'll give a lot of things to you. Don't worry about it. Abram is getting the hookup by worldly standards, but it's costing Abram something. 
It's costing him the integrity and the sanctity of marriage. It's costing him his wife. He's lost all sense of right and wrong. I heard one pastor say this, and I love this, so pay attention, please. Write this down if you can. Sinful decisions will always call on you to sacrifice something. Sinful decisions will always call on you to sacrifice something. Now, I'm not trying to say this would have been easy. I'm not trying to say that. I'm not trying to say it would have been easy. I mean, he's afraid for his life, and he should be. But Abram should have remembered the promises that God gave him. Let's go through the real quick verse 3 of Genesis 12. You don't have, you have that one? Yeah, thank you. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, how is that going to all happen, be blessed through you, if you and your wife are dead? It's not going to happen. I'm no fertility expert, but if you're dead, there's no chance of having a child. It's over. It's going to be over. But God gave him a promise of protection. It said, I got you. Everything's going to be fine. I have your back, and I need you to survive. But Abram is basically saying, Lord, I don't trust your promises. I don't trust you and, and what you got going on. I need to protect myself. I'm going to plot and I'm going to scheme. Sometimes, guys, the worst thing we can do, and it sounds contrary to the way the world is, teaches us how to be, be, is the worst thing we can do is try to protect ourselves. I'm not trying to say physically. I'm not talking about an intruder comes in your house. I'm just trying to say sometimes we, we, get, with, we get a situation and we, instead of giving it to God at the altar, we give it to God at the feet of the cross. We say, you know what? I'm going to take care of this situation. And before we know, we haven't even prayed about the situation. We haven't given it to him. We haven't called a Christian friend and, hey, would you pray with me? I'm dealing with a difficult circumstance. We just go ahead and we start plotting and we part scheming. Isn't that right? I mean, I've been there. I've been there where I started plotting and scheming and figuring out how am I going to fix my problem. But God gets great honor and love and joy in fixing your problems. I mean, we see throughout the Bible. We see, look, at the, look at the story of Jehoshaphat. He says, the battle is the Lord's. The battle, your battle today. Don't try to fight with it. Don't try to scheme with it. Give it to the Lord and watch him work. God promised that he would give grace and he would go ahead and give protection. And he does the same thing for us, guys. Guess what? You'll be on this earth until he doesn't want you on this earth. He's, our God is in complete control. That is a fact. Our God is sovereign and he's patient and he's loving and he's full of grace. And yes, he can deal with your mistakes, but he wants to do something awesome in your life. But you have to trust him. You got to give it to him. Don't fight him. I remember when I first became a Christian, I had a hard time giving my life to him. I just give it to you. And I still battle sometimes with that. But especially early on, I give my life to you. Because what it does is it takes that power away from you. Because we're taught to take care of our own. But really there's a God up there who loves you, who has complete power. And he wants to fight your battles. He wants you to trust him. The Lord, of course, was not happy with what went on. Whenever you see the words in the Bible, inflicted serious diseases, that's not good. That means he's upset. He's very powerful and he's very real. And he did not like what happened here. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. And he said, what have you done here? What have you done to me? I mean, why did you tell me that she's your wife? Take your wife and leave. It must have happened, bam, bam, because Pharaoh knew what exactly happened. Take, give him the stuff what we gave him. I don't care. Just get him out of here. We don't want to deal with this stuff any longer. So what do we do with this very, so every single time we go through the Bible in the Old Testament, 
the challenge can be sometimes to find how to apply this to our life. We always want to take an Old Testament story like this and any story in the Bible. We want to read it, and we know it's good for correction and reproof, but we want to take it, we want to apply it to our life. Like, how, what can I take from it, and how can I take this and learn and go ahead and be equipped to go ahead and live my life for God? Well, first of all, like we just talked about, we see Abraham not trusting God. We see it. And whether you realize it or not, every single day, we have to trust God. Where's our food going to come from? You know, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? We trust God. We trust God. Whether we realize it or not, you're trusting God with certain things. But God doesn't just want you to trust a little bit of things. God wants you to trust all to him. Your life, your soul, your everything. We need to ask ourselves these questions. Do I trust him with my future? Do I trust him with my future? Or am I going to go ahead and say, yes, I'll give you A, B, and C, but and that's fine, but I'm, I'm going to take care of this. Do we trust his plan for us? Do we trust him when things look bleak? When you've had the worst day of your life and it looks like there's no end in sight and you have no idea what about to do, to do with a problem, are you going to trust him then? Abram is not the only one that was given promises. You as believers who put their trust and faith in Christ, you have promises. And you have many promises about what he will do if you do this or I will do this. Unconditional promises and conditional promises. So today to refresh your memory and to refresh mine, I'm just going to give you a couple promises that God promises those who put their trust and faith in him. The first promise is in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. It says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. Guys, if you love him and you put your trust and faith in him, anything that you go through, this scripture says, he will work it out. He's either doing something in somebody else, or he's doing something in you, or he's doing something in the future. But make no mistake about it, he's in complete control, and he sees what you're going through, and he's going to work it out. Somehow, someway, you're going to learn something, you're going to grow in your faith, and he's going to be glorified. He's in complete control. That's a promise of God. Romans, that's just one. Another promise is, I love this one. I quote this to myself. More, I should do it more than I should. I do. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. It says, being confident of this, that he began a good work in you, will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. This is saying right here, no matter where you are, Christian, no matter where you are, what you're doing today, if you put your trust and faith in me, I have work to do in your life. I'm not giving up on you. That thing you've struggled with for five years or ten years or one month, I will work it out. Put your trust and faith in me, and I will do a mighty work in you. We can trust God with our future. We can trust him with our failures. Isn't that comforting? I take great, great comfort in that. Next one. God promises peace when we pray. I love this one right here. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation. Notice this. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That promise right there, every single one of us should do every single week and remind ourselves every single week. I don't care if you have to take a post-it note and put it all over your house. We need to be anxious about nothing, the Word of God says. But in every situation, with prayer and petition, guys, He wants to meet you where you are. He wants to do something awesome. He wants to give you peace. He wants to guard your hearts and your minds. Isn't this comforting? 
that this is in the word of God. I, another one, I love Jesus promised rest, kind of a brother and sister with this one, and that's in Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30. You know what well. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is comfortable and my burden is light. He's like, just trust me. Just come to me. Do something awesome. I need you to come to me. It's for your own good. I've promised you this. I take great comfort in these. And I got one more for you. Jesus promised abundant life when we come to him and we follow him. And John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to, to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it in full. God wants to fill the heart, the empty hole in every single one of us. He wants to fill you with his spirit. He wants to fill you with that peace and that joy that only he can provide. Before I came to Christ, if I would have known about this, maybe I would have came to Christ earlier, I don't know. But I had a big hole right here in my, in my spirit, man. And I tried to fill it with every single thing but God. But when I came to Jesus, this thing was full. I mean, I had, I had a self-worth. I had a purpose. I had love. I had all these things I didn't have before. But when I put my trust and faith in Jesus, he filled this dark hole. Those are just a few promises that God gives us for those who believe in him. We need to trust these promises. We need to learn these promises. You might not concentrate on the promises of God, but I'm here to tell you to open up that word, see what it says, and then apply it to your life. Rely on these promises. Quote these promises. One of my favorite books I have at home is the promise book I have. It's about this big, about that wide, about this tall, and it's just a little paperback book. Probably bought it for a dollar somewhere. And it's just full of God's promises. It's one of my favorite books. He wants to remind you of the promises he has for you, and he wanted to remind Abram of the promises he had for him that day. But let's not forget these promises. Let's believe in these promises. Let's trust these promises. We either, if we don't trust these promises, what's going to happen? We're going to plot and we're going to scheme. We're going to give up. We're going to get angry with God or angry with others. We're going to lie at times. We're going to get desperate. We're going to try to do things on our own strength. But he wants us to fully rely on him, fully trust in him. He wants us to dig deeper. Dig deeper with your walk with God. And cling to his promises. And pray. And seek his face. He wants all those things from us. Why? Because he loves us, and he cares for us, and he wants what's best for you. Let the Spirit lead us, guys. When we're going into a difficult situation, let us be so in, so in tune with the Holy Spirit, with our relationship with Jesus, that we can tell, hey, we can hear those promises. We can hear the Spirit tell us what to do. Let's be intentional. Let's get into the Word and do what it says. He has great things in store for you with great peace and amazing things. You can take full confidence that he knows you and he loves you. And he knows what's best for you. Let's let this powerful God take our life, right? Let's, let's lay our life at the feet of the cross and say, you know what? I can't do this. I've tried living my life without you. It does not work. But I trust you. I know you have a plan. I know you're a sovereign God who sees all and loves me. I give my life to you. I trust you because you are good and you are love. Trusting is when we have faith in God. If we love Jesus and we believe that he died on that cross and he came back and his word is full with these promises and full of that story, why would we not trust his promises? Trusting is believing. 
the promises of God in all circumstances. If we have faith, we will trust. Only by trusting him are you promised peace. Let me repeat that again. Only by trusting him are you promised peace with him. How valuable is peace, guys? Oh, my word. If I didn't have peace and outside this, these walls in 2022 in America, I mean, come on now. We need peace. We need that peace that only he can provide. I mean, look, look what's going on out there. It's madness. But yet we can still have peace within us and go out there with our head high, knowing that he's in control, knowing that he's calling the shots. And all you have to do is abide and believe and trust. I love this uh, scripture about trusting. It's in Proverbs 3, uh, 5 and 6. It's probably the most famous trusting scripture there is. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Come on now. That is awesome. Can we, can we do something? Can we say that together? Let's say that together. Okay, here we go. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. And a day in the days where nobody has their path straight, we can have our path straight through trusting him. Isn't that so comforting? I love that promise of God. This verse sums up all the Bible for us. Trusting, leaning on him, understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him. Guys, he's calling us into a deeper relationship in 2022. I believe that he has a deeper relationship for every single person in here today. Isn't that exciting? I mean, God wants us to be closer to him. I love that. I need more of him. I don't want to separate myself from him. I want to get right up and say, Lord, do something awesome in me. Make my marriage better. Make my relationship with my kids better. Make me a better pastor. Make me a better son. I want to be better, Lord. That's how You want to be a better of all those things? Guess what? Get closer to Jesus. You want to fix your marriage? Get closer to Jesus. You want to be closer to your kids? Get closer to Jesus. Because when his spirit comes alongside of you and the spirit tells you what to do, you got it. Wait and be patient and trust him. His plan is perfect. His plan is purposeful. Perfect. I have a hard time saying that word. His plan is full of purpose. <laughs> we are to commit every single aspect of our lives and have complete confidence in his greatness. We are, to, we are not to trust ourselves. Don't trust yourselves, guys. It's not the opposite of what the world teaches, right? Trust yourself. You're great who you are. I'm like, no, I'm terrible. I have nothing great in me. All that's great is him. That's it. That's him. I don't trust me at all. Are you kidding me? I tried doing this the first 20 years of my life. It was terrible. I don't trust myself one bit. I trust in that cross. I trust in him for me. That's what I do. I trust in his greatness. Because our understanding is so temporal, isn't it? Our understanding is, such, is so finite. It's so tainted by our own sin natures and our own sin desires. We constantly want to get in our way, don't we? With our own desires, our own flesh. Trusting in ourselves is like tr trusting in the Detroit Lions front office. We've seen it mistake year after year after year and no end in sight. Not like I'm, one, I'm a Bears fan. I, I have room to talk. It doesn't make sense, though, to trust in something that's failed continually, does it? The definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again and expecting the same results. That that is the definition of insanity. I don't want to do that. I don't want to trust myself. I don't want to plot. I don't want to scheme. I want to trust that. I want to trust God the Father through the Son and the Holy Spirit. He is for you guys. He is. If you're ever doubting if God is for you, take that away. He loves you more than anybody.
and he wants you to trust him. He wants you to have a relation with him. He wants you to dig into this awesome word of God and read what it says and do what it says and see what God does through you. I I believe that every single person in here wants to be used by God. But how are we going to be used by God if we don't trust his plan? How can we be used by God in a mighty way if we don't trust that he knows what he's doing? He's going to get you to here before he can do something awesome. Some of us are just down here. If we're going to be real this morning. But he's calling you up. He's, he's, he's expecting something greater from you. It's easy to obey God when every single thing is going right, isn't it? Every single thing is fine. I, I trust God. But what, when, what about when things get hard? Then you see if you really trust God. Then you see if you really have faith. Trusting and having faith in him through obedience, doing that day after day, you will see the best life you ever could have expected because you will be full and he'll be glorified. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for, thank you for your grace. Thank you for being a God who doesn't give up on us, Lord. Lord, we truly lay ourselves down today. We truly know, Lord, that whatever is inside of us, Lord, is is not the best, but you are the best, Lord. We know that, Lord, that you are sovereign and you are powerful and you want what's best for us. You want us to give us that abundant life. You want to give us that supernatural peace, Lord Jesus. We give every single thing to you, Lord. Make every single life in this church, Lord, through your spirit, make our lives about you and not ourselves, not our desires, Lord. Let us trust you. Let us trust you today and tomorrow when things get hard, Lord. Let us not lean on our own understanding. Let's acknowledge you in all ways, Lord. We give this church to you. So with every single head bowed and every eye shut, there's more, like I said, there's lots of promises in the Bible. And in one promise, it says, it says, if you put your trust and faith in me, you'll be safe. If you are born again, if you have a a spiritual new life, by trusting me and believing in me, you'll be saved. I promise, the Lord says, that you won't have to suffer hell. I promise that you that you will spend eternity with me in heaven and where there's no crying, there's no sorrow, there's no pain. I promise you those things, God says in his word. And all someone has to do is believe in my son, Jesus. And if you believe in my son, Jesus, the Bible says, all your sins are wiped away. There's a clean slate. I forgive those sins. And if you put your trust and faith in me, you'll have real purpose. You'll have real relationship with your creator. And all I expect you to do is believe in me. And live your life for me. If you confess with your tongue and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Bible says that you're saved. That is a promise from his word. So I'm going to give an opportunity to respond to that. With every single head bowed and every single eye shut, If you want to take that promise and you want to secure your place in heaven with the Father and the Son and the Spirit for the rest of existence, would you slip your hand up right now and acknowledge his love? Acknowledge his salvation plan for you. Go ahead and confess it. Raise your hand and say, yes, I want to be saved.
truly believe that you're calling us to the next level, Lord. You're asking us, Lord Jesus, to dig deeper. You're asking us to go, which we talked about last week. You're asking us to dig deeper. But it's, it's going to take trust, Lord. It's going to take great trust. So with every, I'm going to go ahead and do another prayer here. Another question. So with every single head bowed and every eye shut, you're saying, you know what? I want to trust him more. I don't trust him as much as I should sometimes. I acknowledge that right now. My life can be kind of messy sometimes. It can, it can, it can feel like I, I have no idea what's going on. I'm just up in the wind. But I know I need to trust him more. If that's you, would you slip up your hand? I'm slipping up my hand too. I need to trust him more, what God's doing in my life. I want to pray with you. Thank you. Come alongside us, Lord. We truly want to become more like you. We don't want to fear. We don't want to plot. We don't want to scheme. We don't want to lie, Lord Jesus. We just want to trust you. We know, Lord, and we acknowledge that you are in complete control, and you know what you're doing. We love you, Lord, and we trust you this morning. We pray this, Lord Jesus, in your precious name. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you for never giving up on us. Bless today and bless this week, Lord Jesus, please. In your name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming this morning. You're awesome. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Let your light.